this Judge O'Brien. After a hard day's work. A dark, dark, stormy, horrible night. There was a light, a small light, in a cottage beside the road. And uh, Judge O'Brien said, inquire, inquire. Knocked at the door of this cottage. Door opened. Out came a woman. As I said, a kindly looking woman. And he saw her better now by the light of the few candles that were there. Well, well, what do you want? And she said, nothing, ma'am, only to know where are we. A moment later, Judge O'Brien walked in and <laughs> was made welcome. Now, welcome, of course, meant giving the man something to warm him up. She went about her business and made up this concoction for the judge, handed it to him and said, try that, sir. God almighty, he said, what is that? Of course, it was an egg flip. By the time he had the third one, the judge, the shivering was gone and he was in a good mood. So he said, would you have a bit of paper? But of course, the poor woman, paper? In a cottage like that, among poor people, at the end of the 18th century, paper was as valuable as silver almost. Then the young fellow went out to the coach, came back with a page of one of the court notebooks, handed it to the judge. The judge took out a quill and wrote out what turned out to be a license. So, Fergal, can you describe the layout of your pub? I suppose from the exterior, you think a nice cottage-style thatch pub, but when you come in, it's a little bit different. We obviously have our traditional bar at the side. Uh, then we have attached to that, there's a little snug come kitchen with a turf fire, and it's actually where the owners of the pub used to, or my family, should I say, used to, to live and, and, and cook and eat and everything. Then you come into this lounge area, and this is where we have our parties. People have a bite to eat. And then that leads out onto our, uh, our garden. We've got a really nice garden at the back where people can do a bit of al fresco dining or a few drinks uh, when we get the weather, of course. And there's quite a lot of history to this place. The pub goes back to, I suppose, even before it got its first licence in 1790. It was a sort of a stop-off point between Ennis and Kilrush and it's one of Ireland's oldest family-run pubs, so I suppose the beauty there is that a lot of the memorabilia, a lot of the old pictures, newspaper clippings have been handed down from generation to generation, so um, we've all sorts of stuff, letters from the White House, uh, you know, pictures of famous people that have visited here, and even Fanny uh, wedding ring, and you know, so yeah, we've lots of, lots of cool stuff. And you've a lot of tradition, say, in the pub. Do you host live music? Yeah, well, Lissa Casey is, is famous for its concertina players. We have a number of All-Ireland champions. On a Friday night, we have trad music, and on Sunday evenings, we have sessions as well. So, And there's always an impromptu session. There's always willing, someone willing to sing a song or uh, play some music. So, Do you find tourism is important for your pub? Hugely so. Um, I suppose when people are coming to Ireland and they have a picture of uh, a traditional Irish pub, we probably um, tick all the boxes in that, in that regard. Uh, we, you know, we've, we've made the pub comfortable over the years, but we've been very sympathetic to the, to the history, uh, which is very important to us. So when you walk into Fanny O'Dee's, you know, you're walking into the, the real McCoy. It's such a good working environment, the customers. There's such a diverse um, range of customers from every corner of the world. So one thing I love about Fanny O'Dee's is the, the wide range of events that you'd have on. So you have the traditional side of music, dance, and then also the, the more young side of it with the 21st. And you serve food here? We do indeed. Uh, we serve uh, food right through the summer and on the off-season we serve on weekends and stuff. So. Yeah, we do all the sort of traditional lamb stew um, and we do the most amazing uh, deluxe beef burger. We're noted for our burgers and our curries, so I like to give it a modern twist as well. Have you any specialities? We have indeed. Uh, how the pub got its first licence was way back in 1790 and Fanny O'Dee herself had a special recipe for the egg flip. Uh, we don't know where she got the recipe, but the recipe has been handed down from generation to generation, so we still make uh, 
that egg flip. It's the, the very same recipe, but we offer a few variations. You can get it with whiskey, brandy, or Baileys. So, uh, yeah, it's it's quite unique to the house. It's the only place in Ireland where you can get the egg flip. And there's no way you'd let us in on the recipe? Unfortunately, Michelle, unless you marry into the family, you won't be. Uh, you can ask my wife, Martina, uh, when she actually married me. We had a, an induction session where all the doors were closed, the blinds were pulled, and she, she got to learn the, the recipe for myself. So, yeah, it's a, it's a closely guarded secret. If you come into Fenio Days, you might meet the woman of your dreams. You, meet, you might meet the barman here, a very, very pleasant man. He might engage you in conversation that will keep you here for the next three hours. He might even sell you four or five egg flips that you mightn't even be able to leave the premises because they're very, very strong. I'll guarantee you, secret recipe that has come down, he will tell you, over eight solid generations. No place else in Clare or in the world are that to be got. Take not my word for it, his. And I see family is very important here, and you have your family tree up on the wall even. How important is it for you to have a family run business? Um, absolutely. You know, the, the pub goes back to 1790, and, and I suppose normally a business lasts in a family maybe three generations, but uh, the pub has been in our family for eight generations. And, you know, from the age of four, you, you begin to hear stories about the history of the pub, and you hear your granny telling stories about the pub, and you, you remember your granny serving the first pint of Guinness, and I suppose it's something that stays with you. So family and the pub and having one of us here at all times is, is really important. There's hundreds, if not thousands, of people who have called here to Fanny O'Dea's down the years to partake of the famous egg flip or drink a good pint or whatever, eat a good meal. But, but the old people used to always say that whether you want to eat, or drink or partake, you should always call, at least. If I could describe Fenudis in one sentence, I would have to say a truly traditional Irish pub, um, full of great history, full of great characters, and uh, has such amazing array of stories to tell. Rona, how are you? Good, and you're very welcome to Healy Max, Andy. Oh, cheers for having us. So you're the manager of Healy Max, yeah? That's right. I'm the general manager of Healy Max here at Brafie House Resort. We opened in April 2015, at the end of April. So it's been a, a roller coaster a few months, uh, but it's it, we've, we've got off to a great start, and it's 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 going down well. At this stage, there are four Healy Max in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, one in Ipoh and one in Penang, so that's the six in Malaysia. Uh, and then we opened one in Medan in Indonesia. So uh, it's expanding and as I say, this is the first in Europe and hopefully the, the first of many. The chain is owned and operated by a man called Liam Healy, who is originally from Glenamoy in North Mayo. He's a conqueror in the world. Yeah, slowly but surely. A little, a little bit of mayo everywhere. Sure. Ah, love they love that. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, it's uh, you don't go anywhere in the world without meeting a mayo person or seeing a mayo for Sam sign. You know, so um, yeah, we're, we we very much fly the mayo flag. The decor throughout the bar is very much in keeping with the Healy Max bars in Asia. So. When you go over there, and hopefully you'll, you'll get to visit uh, some of the bars. Some straight the, after this. Straight after. Yeah. Um, for a start, all of our chairs, our high chairs, uh, would have come from, from Malaysia. Our bar counter, that's Malaysian walnut. We also have a, a number of signature tables, I suppose. One piece in particular, it's, it's a huge piece, and actually very soon after we opened, 
people come in and they say, oh, I love that table and God, I, you know, I'd love that in my house or a piece like that. And I kind of say, well, if you think you can carry it out, <laughs> knock yourself out, but you won't get very far. Because uh, we were opening a, an Irish bar in Mayo, one of the things that, that I did was put together a list of Mayo's famous sons and daughters. And you have everybody from George Moore to uh, Raftery on Filla to um, Grown Your Whale. And also Louis Walsh. Louis Walsh, you know, yeah. and I suppose we all love a, a little bit of history and um, it's a great conversation starter and it, it, it gives character, I, I guess, to, to the place. Um, and it's, it's, it, it's something that, that has proved very popular. Food is a huge part of the business. We would brand ourselves as Healy Max Irish Bar and Restaurant. So it's not just pub grub. I, I suppose we're more uh, gastro or bistro uh, style. Our, our menu, there would be a number of staples that, that we would have um, in all of the Healy Max bars. Our beef and Guinness pie, for example. Uh, that's a recipe of one of our chefs in Jalan P. Romley in Kuala Lumpur, Wawa. Similarly, pizzas, uh, our pizza dough and our sauces, they're all recipes that are used throughout the, the Healy Max outlets. In the summer of 2014, Liam Healy and three other businessmen bought Brafie House Resort. So it's, it's a full resort property, uh, it's 90 acre estate. The hotel needed a lot of work and one of the things obviously they looked at was the bar. The bar hadn't been touched in about 40 years. It, it needed revamping, it needed revitalising. So while Healy Max now is, is quite a long uh, bar, it had been broken up into several rooms, so there was a need to remove um, some internal walls during the refurbishment. Krona, you put this unusual box in front of me. What exactly is it? Basically, this time capsule is from 1905, so 110 years ago. It was placed in the wall by Dominic Brown. Um, and so inside the capsule, you have this letter and it says on it to whoever shall open the sealed leaded box containing these papers I commend this envelope and its contents for preservation and in a nutshell it's 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 the box wherein this is contained was placed by me and you know it's it's just kind of for whoever to to find it uh, it, it it speaks a little or he speaks in the letter writes a little bit about uh, family connections and the history of, of Brafey House. And then as well as that, we have, this is the Connacht Telegraph. And this is a copy from February the 4th, 1905. This here is a picture and the old plan as such of, of Brafey House as it was. Oh wow, that is stunning. Yeah, so, uh, and and it came kind of hand in hand with this. So that's Brafey as it was. And then this is alterations and additions to Brafey Castle Bar, 1904 and 1905. Um, it's pretty much a dream find yeah, for anyone absolutely. to get, isn't it? This is what people did before Netflix. This is what people did before Twitter and Netflix. Uh, the Illustrated London News, and that is dated January 28th, 1905. This is the Western People, February the 4th, 1905. Okay, obviously they're fragile and, and we're wearing gloves, but these are 110 years old, you know. Um, so it's just, it's fascinating uh, to, to see how well they survived. Yeah. This is a copy of the Irish Times. God, we thought broadsheets were big nowadays. Like, that's the size that the actual newspaper was uh, in width. So uh, that's quite extraordinary. So uh, in, in his letter, Dominic lists the various newspapers that are here. And it says, together with a set of Victorian currency, that, that was the, the currency, the, the Victorian currency in, in 1905. You know, and, and particularly uh, when... Healy Max is so much about the old memorabilia, um, 
it's extraordinary to to uh, uncover a find like this and a genuine piece of our past, genuine. right? Absolutely, yeah. So, um, so we're we're going to um, we're going to preserve uh, all of these, obviously, and hopefully in a hundred years' time, people will still be coming back to have a look at at what the the Browns left behind in 1905. Excellent. Well, look, I'm going to take the change because I forgot, <laughs> I forgot to leave a tip when I was getting right, the dinner. No problem. Um, but cheers to Sean. You go and get me a pint as well. Excellent. So. Right. Well, look, you <laughs> said this. You put all that together. I'm going to leave a tip. All right. Cheers to that. Thanks, Andy. I grew up in the pub industry. It's, as I say, it's in my blood. I've been doing it for that long now. I might as well keep doing it. <laughs> uh, my favourite part about working in Helium Max B, I'd say, is the friendship and the. Uh, just between the staff and themselves, the way everybody gets on, that itself, the positivity of it all, really reflects onto the customer. Healy Max, in just a few words, I would probably sum it up as a lively uh, sports bar with uh, an atmosphere to suit of all ages and all genders. It's about a place that the diaspora can can gather. It's a it's a social hub and, and a you know celebrates the culture of Ireland, the food, the music. It's the Cade Mila Falcha. Uh, it's the Cade Mila Falcha that that Ireland has always been known for, and that Ireland has been celebrated for. So, Carl, there's quite a bit of history to this bar. How far does it date back? We have paper going back to 1827, and so we'll soon be 200 years selling alcohol. It's been passed on over the generations, and I am the seventh, hopefully, to pass it on to the eighth generation. And is it still the original structure here? No, we have pictures where it was a thatched cottage. It got burnt down and they built a second story on top of it then. When I did up the place eight years ago, a lot of the local older farmers and whatnot, older people in the area said that they figured that there was never a foundation underneath here. Right. And if, when we took it away at the back there, you could see that it was just built on cornerstones. So it is amazing that it's, 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 it's a very sound, solid structure, but to be just built on cornerstones, it's, it's amazing that it stayed as well as it is as well. And did you grow up in the bar yourself? Did, yeah. My father took over here from his father in 1969, I think. I was four at the time. My three brothers and three sisters and myself were reared upstairs here in the business. Yeah. There was very little time for studying or anything like that, so we were carted off into boarding school, into Tume and different places around to try and get an education. The memories I have of coming down from a lovely new bungalow in Tume and having to bring up my kids here in the pub upstairs. A farmer used to come in here and tell me there was a there was a laying hen every generation. Do you know what that means? Yeah. I was the laying hen and this second salve coming in. Charlie Sheridan was the laying hen in the last generation. The generation before that was um, Anthony Sheridan. He was a teacher. So I don't think we'd be still here if there wasn't a laying hen. It was either at the band here as well as the pub. You know, that's the secret. A laying hen, he used to call it. I came in the door there from school. Uh, there was a man that said, oh, here comes the laying. <laughs> so. so there is a lot of history in the place. As I say, we'll, in, in 2027 now, we'll uh, celebrate in 200 years as selling beer in the premises. So we'll have a big celebration if we're still around. That's that 12 years time, hopefully we'll be still around then. And you have a restaurant here as well? We have. We have a two function rooms and a 50-seater uh, restaurant that we open on Friday, Saturday and Sunday evenings. Uh, but our main business would be passing traffic Monday to Sunday. We open at 10 o'clock in the morning until 9 o'clock at night for food. We have a 130-seater function room and we hold a lot of different events in there, anything from christenings to funerals and every family event between those. Uh, we can hold them here at Jordan's. We have all different types of menus in our chef designs, different types of menus, whether it's finger food, to soup and sandwiches, to buffet style, to a five course gourmet meal, whatever they want, we can, we can do it. How's it going, Joe? Hi, you're things? welcome to Milltown. Thanks very much. Thanks for meeting us today. Uh, okay, my pleasure. So you uh, brew Sheridan's craft beer? That's correct, yeah. It's a new endeavour of ours. Uh, we've, uh, it's been a kind of something that we've been developing over two or three years but as you know it's seven generations here so it's kind of 
it's fitting that it only that we bring this to the market to our customers. We have uh, three beers uh, that we have available. Um, we have a Weiss beer, German natural brewed and handcrafted in small batches, no chemicals. And we do two other beers. Then we do a ruby. Uh, uh, it's a red ale. Probably a custom that most Irish people are used to red ales. And then we do a blonde beer, which is slightly lower in alcohol. It's for the our female customers kind of thing. All our wheats that we use for our vice beers are all organic. Um, we mill them ourselves, um, so the setting is quite important if, uh, to, get the, the, to get the most of that sugar out of the milled grain to ensure that you get a good yeast harvest and propagation to get the, the fermentation going. Maybe do you want to we'll pull a glass and maybe you could try it? Oh. These styles of beer are delivered with high head intensity. So you, uh, you, you, that plumpiness of head is part of the style. You need that, it's kind of that it leaves a, a lacing on your mouth, similar to what chocolate would leave on your, the back of your tongue. You know how you, they, some chocolates will rinse off your tongue? But the, these style of beers, you want that so that it will hold. It, it's for the aesthetic, but also for the way it, 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 it sits on your tongue. Let's have a go and see. What about one, one for the cameraman? That's amazing. That's beautiful. To me, I suppose, it's, it's all about sense of community. Like here, I, I opened here this morning and I had a local guard in, I had a local postman in, I had a couple of ladies from Mass in there. We'd be a focal point in the village for anybody and everybody. We're on the N17, the main artery from Derry to Kerry. We'd have an awful lot of repeat customers from Donegal, Sligo, and west of Mayo, the Bell Mullet area. Plus a, a, a huge local following here. Locals ranging from 18 years of age to some lads are Jim Brook Daly, be our oldest customer, Jim is 98 or something like that. And he's still hearty and healthy and able to sit up and order a pint of Smithix any time to come in the door. There's a lot of different angles to pub game now anymore that just mainly diversify. You have, to diver you have to be doing something different to stay in the pub game now. But I'm in it the less born here and reared here and I'll be dragged out the door out of here, uh, I'm not going to leave it. Uh, I don't know about the next generation whether they'll take it on or not, but I love it. I buzz off it every day. beauty about pub work is you don't know what's going on or who's going to walk in the door any day. I have some customers that walk in the exact same time here every day. I could set a clock by them and then I don't know who else is going to walk in the door. So that's the beauty about going to work in a pub. You're meeting new people, hearing different stories. That's the beauty about the fair game. That's what I love about it, I think.